Welcome to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's the official podcast of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. To keep current with developments here at the Institute, you can check out our blog at maxwellinstituteblog.org. I'm Blair Hodges, and today I'm joined in this episode by George Handley. He's an environmentalist and Brigham Young University professor of comparative literature, and he's the author of the book Home Waters, A Year of Recompenses on the Provo River. The book describes itself as a blend of nature writing, local history, theology, environmental history, and personal memoir. You can email questions or comments about today's episode to blairhodges at byu.edu or join the conversation on our Facebook page. All right, we're here with George Handley. Thanks for joining us, George. Thank you for having me. Um, first, I just want you to uh, describe a little bit about yourself uh, and the work you do and, and maybe a little bit about your job here at uh, Brigham Young University. Okay. Uh, well, I teach in the Department of Humanities, Classics, and Comparative Literature. My degree uh, as both, well, all my degrees are in comparative literature, specifically Latin American and American literatures. Um, I do a lot on what's called environmental humanities or eco-criticism, looking at the relationship between literature and the environment. Um, and uh, I'm now serving as chair of the Department of Humanities, Classics, and Comparative Literature. And I've lived here in Utah. Um, I was born here and moved back in 1998 after leaving as a young boy. The thing that I want to talk to you most about today is a book that you published a couple of years ago. Um, it's called Home Waters. It's a unique book. I haven't, uh, I haven't actually read a book like this before. It's, it's sort of a combination of eco-history combined with some theology, combined with a little autobiography and some You've got some elements of literature in it where you're quoting different authors. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the with the genre. It's listed as nature writing slash memoir. Is that is that a common genre or is this something that? Um, you've... Well, uh, that's a it's a tough one to describe. I, I um, yes, there are memoirs, of course, and there's of course lots of nature writing that is somewhat autobiographical. I had originally thought I would write sort of a brief history of the Provo River just as a sort of service to protecting the river and being uh, helping raise awareness about it. But I had read, um, while doing that, I, I was reading a book by a literary critic uh, named John Elder uh, called Reading the Mountains of Home. And in that book, he um, devoted uh, roughly a third of his attention to writing about Robert Frost. He lives in Vermont, and then he, and he decided to relate the poem to the geography of Vermont and then he told his own story in Vermont while he was doing all of that at once and I thought it was one of the most interesting fascinating books I had read in a long time and and he was a literary critic like I am and it just sort of gave me permission to do something a little bit different um, in this book. So you're sort of reflecting on the geography of Provo. This is Provo, Utah. Um, it's where Brigham Young University is located have you brought your literary criticism tools to bear on landscapes? Have you have you seen any? Uh, have you connected like methodologically some of the things, some of the tools you use in literary criticism with how you interpret landscapes? Uh, yeah, environmental humanities is a growing field um, that is looking at the relationship broadly between culture and nature, and certainly artistic representation and nature, not just nature as a theme or nature as a background, but um, really aggressively looking at ecological understandings um, present in rep different representations of, of the landscape. Uh, the, the general assumption is that ecological understanding has, has needs greater attention in our society today and so a lot of uh, eco-critics like myself look at culture to try to mine um, either philosophy, religious thought, novels and poetry, uh, landscape paintings, uh, for their ecological understandings. Um, and then, and then, you know, sort of, um, use that as a pedagogical method in the classroom. So I was, I was already engaging in that sort of teaching, but in relationship to the natural environment, I, I found myself, um, relating to the environment, not only as someone who studies the humanities, but also as someone who's LDS and a person of faith. And also like someone who's enthusiastic about just being in the outdoors, right? Because a lot of the book uh, talks about your experiences outdoors uh, yeah. with the Provo River as you sort of traced 
you traced the Pearl River back to its headwaters and then followed it through its various windings and, and how it's been adjusted due to, due to human uh, engineering and whatnot. And, and you sort of, you, you hike and you fish and you, you talk about the outdoors. So um, one of the ways you start off that way is by talking about your friend John. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of the beginning of, of the book and maybe the beginning of the idea of your home water. So um, take a second and sort of talk about that experience that you had with John when you discovered yeah. your home waters. Well, I had lived, um, I mean, I've lived in the East. I did all my schooling in California and uh, was teaching in Arizona before coming to BYU. And in Arizona in particular, I had, and I narrate some of this in the in the preface to the book, but I had some friends there who were very interested in the intersection between religion and the environment and the importance of a sense of place. And I started reading quite a bit about that. And I think I really wanted to live somewhere in a deeply rooted way and I really admired a lot of the families that I knew in Flagstaff who were like that. I mean I remember sitting around a campfire at a Boy Scout event and there were three generations of one family sitting by that fire and I just thought wow that's a beautiful thing and I'd really like that. I just didn't know if Flagstaff was going to be the place for me to do that and when I took a job, uh, took my job here at BYU because I had been born in this state and had pioneer roots and so on it, it just felt like okay this is this is the last move I hope I ever have to make. And so I, I was very intentionally trying to cultivate a deeper relationship with the land. So I'm actually not by dis- disposition or by background like a really serious outdoorsman. I mean, I've done a fair amount of backpacking, but probably no more than the average person. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a mountaineer and I don't repel and things like that. I I consider myself a pretty modest outdoorsman, um, but I made recreation um, uh, an intentional activity to try to understand where I was living. I I sort of felt like um, that inhabitation requires reconnaissance, right? If I'm going to live here and I'm going to live here for a long time, I need to be pretty deliberate about what I'm doing with my free time. Um, And so I always tried to make my recreational activities, I mean, I made a deliberate decision over the course of a year. I had a a partial leave during that year and and, um, some other circumstances that allowed me to to build this into my schedule. But basically over the course of 12 months, I kept a nature journal and I said, every time I go out, um, I'm going to go out on the Provo River watershed somewhere I'm going to write about it, um, in part because I felt like the landscape deserved, you know, love and and cherishing and and that kind of treatment. But I also wanted to understand my relationship to the land in a in a more profound and more personal way. And when I got here, I had a very close friend. I uh, still a close friend, but um, no longer here in Utah. But he was. He was here, here, and he was ecstatic about my uh, the chance to teach me fly fishing, which is something I had never learned as a boy. And um, so we we went up. My and my grandfather owned a cabin that he had bought uh, in 1966 when I was just two years old. And uh, I told my friend John, I said, "Well, gee, my my grandpa owns this cabin up on the Upper Provo River. I don't know what the fishing's like up there. We used to fish with worms, but come up with me." You know, he helped me pick my fly fishing equipment out and everything, and taught me how to fish up there. And we, of course, what we discovered is the fly fishing is phenomenal. And he couldn't believe my luck that I had just moved back to Utah and basically had this uh, stretch of river that was available to me anytime I wanted. Um, so we had we had a great time. And so you went up there with John, and in the book you describe your first catch, and you describe it really well. And at the end, I. I'm going to have you read a little uh, section from the book here that I think is one of the guiding keys to the overall book. Okay. I have fished many waters since John and I first drove to the cabin, but I will always prefer the rawness and untamed quality of those upper stretches of the Provo, above the dams and away from the pressure of development. They have indeed become my home waters, a place of return and renewal a chance to explore and reanimate the imagination of memory and a way to explore the ever tenuous reasons for my belonging here. So you're you're up there really reflecting on on this stuff. Was John aware 
um, that, that this is how you were approaching this as an opportunity to, to connect strongly with the landscape? Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's a soul brother and somebody with whom I shared very personal and um, deep conversations. Uh, he was as interested as, as I am in um, literature and in the West and in aesthetic beauty. He was an art major in college, so he was, he, he was um, somebody who responded physically in a visceral way to, to, to the beauty of the landscape around us. And even though he wasn't, didn't have Mormon pioneer roots and wasn't born in Utah, he, he loved it like a native. And so that was contagious, and, and we just fed off of each other. There's an interesting narrative arc in the book with your relationship with John, and you're, you're actually quite candid about um, things that come up between you and, mm-hmm. and difficulties that John has, and, and you're quite candid. So I'm interested to hear um, how he feels about that aspect of the book because it, in some cases, becomes pretty personal. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a, a difficult thing. Uh, John uh, was the one who suggested to me uh, very early on, and maybe for all I know it was that first day, uh, saying you need to write a book about the Provo River, and and you know, you need to you need to put your pen to paper and and do this. And um, and we talked a lot about environmental stewardship together too. So he was very encouraging of my pursuit of that as well. Um, when it got around to the time that I was writing the book, he had already undergone um, a, a significant emotional breakdown, and, and um, mental health issues had had um, taken it, taken their toll on his on his circumstances, and he was no longer living in Utah. And but we were in constant conversation, and I told him I was starting to write a journal about the the Provo River and so on, and he continued to encourage me and. Um, Eventually, I, when I had material ready for him to see that was about him, I said, I'm not going to publish a word of this um, if you don't want me to. And I certainly you know, could disguise you beyond recognition if you want. Um, and he was very, very clear that I shouldn't do any of that and I should just leave it as it is. And he was, he was willing to let me publish what's in the, what's in the book. There's another really personal element to the book uh, alongside um, your experiences with John. Um, it struck me that there, you perform, you juxtapose death and life in the book. After you describe this first catch, which is an exhilarating uh, time, you're, you're in, out in the wilderness experiencing the river and the fish and, and just describing it very poetically, and you suddenly shift to talk, uh, talk about your own brother's suicide something that occurred years ago. Um, I wondered about that juxtaposition, how that, how you decided to put those things together, this wonderful discovery of home waters, switch right over to a discussion of, of your brother's suicide, which is a, obviously yeah. a difficult topic. Um, well, if there's a little bit of a long story to that. I'll try to uh, summarize it quickly, but um, in... Uh, um, in 2000, I had a, um, the visit of the poet Derek Walcott uh, from the Caribbean, came to the Utah Book Festival, and I was his sort of host and took him around for several days. And um, he's the kind of person who, you know, he meets somebody and he immediately wants to know if they write poetry. And if they don't write poetry, he doesn't want to spend any time with them. <laughs> um, and I did write a little bit of poetry, and he asked, and I showed him some poems because he demanded them. and. Uh, and he gave me some criticism. He said, "He said you're trying too hard to write like a poet. Um, you need to you need to write uh, some prose for a while and try to quiet your voice down." And and I said, "Well, what kind of prose?" And he said, "Well, just seek anonymity in your prose. Try try to." Uh, in some of his own writing, he talks a lot about sort of the annihilation of the self in the natural world and in in the places where one finds oneself. And that that's sort of how you find your voice, uh, not through trying too hard, right? So that was that was in the background part of what got me going on this nature journal. And it, ha- it so happened that he came back again in 2004. And at that point, I had written quite a bit of this nature journal and in anticipation that he might ask me to see what I was writing. I had prepared, a, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 pages of this journal for him to look at and 
sure enough, he asked, and so I gave it to him. We were actually driving down to Zion National Park um, uh, to do a reading down there and to show him the park, which uh, was a great experience. Um, but on the way down, uh, he was reading the journal. I was driving the car. My wife and his his wife were in the car, and and uh, he was quiet for about 20 minutes or so as he was reading. And then he demanded that we pull over, and we were in Scipio, uh, <laughs> where there's a yeah. dairy Dairy Queen, and I he think that's he, it in Scipio. He, he we pulled over into the Dairy Queen in Scipio, and we sat down, and he said, "There's a lot of pain in your writing." and I want to know why and um, I said I don't know what you're talking about and he said no there is and I thought this is um, a writer's fantasy or something this is a fiction in his head that he's made up I said they're just descriptions of trails there are descriptions of rivers and water and he says no no no. they're motivated by a pain and I want to know where that pain's coming from and I again just kind of denied or didn't know what he was talking about basically and he said well have you ever experienced any serious trauma in your life and I said well I did um, at this you know my brother took his life in 1982 um, and so this was you know 20 plus years later and I said but I I can reassure you I wasn't thinking about him when I was out on these trails and he didn't care. He just sort of insisted that there was this quality to what I was writing that was infused with a kind of suffering. And then he said, you must write about that. And I said, no, I'm not going to write about that. I'm not interested in talking about it. Not that I'm repressing it. I just don't have any interest in it. And um, so we got back in the car and went along. And I went. we stayed in a bed and breakfast down in Zion that night. And I had a dream that night that I recount in the book about fishing mm -hmm. where I'm, you know, pulling in this fish. And the next thing I know, I've got a baby boy in my arms. And I woke up very emotional, uh, weeping, feeling like something miraculous and beautiful and strange had happened to me. And I couldn't, ex I couldn't understand. I couldn't make sense of what it was. But it really shook me, and um, and at that point I realized I've got to write about my brother. Um, so it was almost immediately after that, I, even though I had done this nature journal, I started writing about his death in some detail and connected it to fishing. And then I realized the book had to be sort of about death and suffering in in relationship to nature and nature's recompenses uh, for that suffering in some way. Just one other detail to that is that as I was getting near the end of the book, I submitted the book to, you know, you typically send it out to some people who've been selected to write blurbs for it. And one of the people who was going to write a blurb for the book read it, and Steve Trimble, Trimble who's a good friend of mine, and he said he wanted the chapter about my brother right up at the front of the book and I said well that's like a house of cards if I move that chapter it's located at a certain place on the river at a certain time of year the the book is really structured quite carefully I can't move it and he said well then you need to talk more about him earlier in the book mm -hmm. because it just it just surprised him too much so I actually rewrote those opening chapters and and I came to a very profound epiphany at the very end of the book that I had been writing this book about the river all along because of precisely because of what I suffered uh, uh, in the loss of my brother's life and that it was not disconnected in any way but it was um, all deeply connected so uh, there's a mystery to that why would natural beauty move us I mean it, it's a mystery in and of itself and why it moves us the way it does, why it sometimes makes us want to weep uh, or feel overwhelmed and feel like nothing in, in the vast universe of things like Moses does when he collapses after seeing the creation. Um, I think that is, is in relationship to the things that we've suffered and lost. And I think um, nature is both you know, promising of renewal, but it's also a reminder of our mortality because it's... it's um, it's where it's where our bodies go, right? Dust to dust, um, and it's where um, where we see visually, you know, life and death moving in cycles, uh, and 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 we don't like to be reminded of that. I mean, I think that those 
So, so sometimes we're afraid of the natural world because it reminds us of our mortality. You also capture sort of the mon. The, you don't fall into a trap where it's where you're always leaping into the sublime, either towards the tragic or the the sublime element of things. There's also some a little bit of the mundane middle ground, and especially with the experiences that you talk about with your with your grandfather. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the one who purchased this cabin that you ended up going to, and and towards the end of his life, you talk about him wanting to build a a dock out. He wanted to fish with you, but he couldn't yeah. go out in the middle of the river, and he proposed building some sort of dock out there. And you, and you talk talk a little bit about that yeah. because that shows an interpersonal relationship that's not romanticized. It's just this this ex, this exchange that you had with your grandpa that, for whatever reason, uh, really resonated with me for its mundanity. Yeah. Well, he 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 couldn't believe we were catching big fish out of that river and many fish. Um, and he he was a little jealous, you know. He was 93, and when he died, uh, and this would have been just a year or two before that, he was not moving very well. Although he was a pretty vigorous uh, man most of his life, he he he, you know, as I was describing, how he just had never learned how to fly fish, really. Uh, he, Plus, he was a man of his times, right? Like he would go hiking in dress shoes or something. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was not. He was not. Um, he wanted to know the the details of how you did it. So as I was describing it to him, I could just hear the sadness in his voice, like, "Well, I guess I'm never going to be able to do that, am I?" You know, and and then he then he just sort of very almost sadly proposed this idea of, "What if we built a a little dock, uh, some wood out onto the stream, and I could just stand on the wood, you know, and then I could cast forward? Would, do you think that would work?" And he had an aneurysm on his aorta that was like seven centimeters long at that point. We knew it. He knew it. And he knew he could die any minute. And the doctors had said, you're too old to operate on, so you're just going to have to hang on. And and I just, you know, we both kind of didn't pursue that. I mean, it was this sort of poignant uh, feeling that without saying anything between us that, well, that's probably a crazy idea. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that, that that was even included because it, if you know someone might say that well that didn't really go anywhere but i think the experience itself uh, took me as a reader someplace uh, this relationship that you had that uh, it was a really touching part of the book so um anyway we're we're here with george handley he's a byu professor he's the author of home waters and uh, the the next thing i wanted to talk to you about is the mormon element of the book you're a practicing member of the lds church but you wrote this book for a wider audience than that. It was published by the University of Utah Press, and, and they publish quite a few titles on Mormonism, but this one um, wasn't, in, in tone at least, um, directed just to Mormons. This is, this is a book that, uh, that could appeal to a lot of different readers. And one thing that interested me is how you delved into some, some Mormon history. And uh, Mormons, it's, it was just, uh, you know, this week is uh, Pioneer Day, so we're celebrating the the pioneer trek, the Mormons entering the valley, and, and, and the story that people typically hear is this um, band of vigorous pioneers that braved the wilderness, that came out to the middle of this uh, desert and, and turned it around, and using their sheer grit and their faith, they made it blossom as the rose. Um, and, and that's a point of pride for, for Mormons. LeGrand Richards, in his book, Mir- um, Marvelous Work and a Wonder makes a really big deal out of uh, uh, Mormons making Utah blossom as the rose. Isn't this something to be so proud of? And environmental historians haven't haven't really taken that uh, view of, of the Mormon entry into the valley. So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about how, um, how environmental historians uh, see, understand that myth of Mormons entering this desert wasteland and flipping it into a, you know, paradise. Yeah, well, there's a lot of complicated issues there. One is that, um, you know, there's a there's a narrative in environmental thought that is um, uh, quite prevalent that is it it's almost a, it's almost deterministic um, because it's a declensionist narrative, right? It, it's it's a, a narrative of the fall, basically, that as soon as human beings at least Westerners in particular, uh, move into an area, its degradation begins, right? 
Um, and Mormonism wanted to sort of offer a different narrative about the significance of their of Mormon arrival in in uh, the West as a instead as the sort of fulfillment, uh, or at least one fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy about the desert blossoming as a rose. So that they're they're sort of and that's actually a very um, uh, ascensionist narrative, right? That, that there's a, a, a inevitable progress that happens when human beings mm -hmm. begin uh, to labor in the land and, and transform the land, that it's all for the better. And I, I find both of those narratives really um, um, unpersuasive in terms of what actually, what, a, what history actually looks like, in terms of what uh, we do to the environment. I mean, sometimes uh, we have mess things up far beyond uh, uh, our intentions um, many many times in fact but sometimes we've been capable of doing the right thing and and we've done some really great things the the implication of both of those narratives is that you know either on the one hand the only way to help the environment is to stop doing anything altogether or get human beings out um, you know and that's not a very practical solution or um, you know do everything you more human engineering will fix the problem and more technology will fix the problem and I and I just sort of resisted both uh, both narratives but as I did the research on the environmental history of Utah I was shocked at how negative um, some of the non uh, uh, non-mormon historians were about um, the Mormon arrival, and not just because it was negative, but because it was actually um, quite ignorant of Mormon theology and Mormon um, belief and Mormon practice. Yeah, I have a few examples here. There's a Donald Worster says that the Mormons are the Lord's beavers, and he wasn't saying that as a compliment. He was sort of depicting them as these people that come in, lay waste, build up a dam, and and, and you know, and that sort of thing. Or or another writer writes that the Mormons. Early Mormons banished themselves out to the desert. Um, you know, he's not taking into account the Mormon experience there. Or another one says that Mormons have made a great project of subduing nature, erecting some towns and places so barren and dry and steep that only a missionary zeal could conquer it. So, yeah, um, this is a narrative of, of antagonism with the desert, is what you describe yeah. as, and you sort of push back against that narrative. A little. I mean, I do acknowledge. Um, I think it's a fine line. I'm trying to split some hairs, but I do. I do think it's important that Mormons recognize that we we did transform the desert in some very negative ways and continue to do so. Right. I mean, I, that's a major concern of mine. Um, but I don't believe in this sort of categorical uh, 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 judgment that these uh, authors have offered. Nor do I think those in, uh, positions are informed by. Um, uh, a more intimate understanding of Mormon culture and Mormon belief and Mormon practice. Like I say, I think they're um, exhibiting a kind of prejudice. I mean, to say that Mormons banished themselves uh, is is absurd on its face, right? Um, um, and it was also, uh, you know, another critic that I that I found, um, whom I actually know, had said that. Uh, you know, Mormonism is the only it's the only religion in America that has an uh, explicitly anti-ecological stance. And I actually spoke to him about that, and I said, "Where, where in the world did you come with that? Come up with that information?" And uh, he acknowledged that he made an error, and that he did not um, he didn't even remember. Uh, there was some study that I think he found that I found that had said that Mormonism was one of the only churches in America that did not have a, a, an explicitly pro-environmental um, branch or institution of their church organized to advocate for stewardship. That's true. Uh, that is not the same thing, of course, as saying that they have an anti-ecological stance. So there's a, you know, when I moved here to Utah, I became very aware that, that um, being concerned about the environment and being Mormon um, for a lot of people on both sides of the issue is not a natural marriage, right? I mean, a lot of Mormons felt like, oh, the environmental issues, that's for people who don't have faith, people who don't trust in God's purposes. Uh, or, on the other hand, environmentalists who say, you know, you can't be a Mormon environmental, you can't care about the environment if you're religious because, again, the assumption is if you have faith in God and God's purposes, then you shouldn't be 
overly worried about what we're doing to the environment. Um, and these again are just these are narratives of almost determinism and predictability that I think really are quite comforting because there's no ethical deliberation necessary <laughs> right. uh, when when confronted with an environmental problem. One of my favorite lines in the book is you sort of resituate the idea of what it means to see the desert blossom as a rose. And, and you, you basically say that, uh, that a lot of early Mormons who came into the uh, Wasatch Front here assumed that blossoming meant something that would happen at our hands, that we would have to do, rather than something that could happen with our eyes and something that we could come to see. That the desert could blossom as a rose according to our perception of the ecology there not because of coming in and making it something that it was never intended to be, i.e. like a garden paradise. I mean, right. Um, well, yeah, and Mormons should be very familiar with that logic, right? I mean, we, we know that perception and attitude uh, have a great impact on our ability to see things that we otherwise wouldn't see. And so if we think we are, if we are looking at the land and always comparing it to what isn't there, we're always feeling like something is needed to add to it. And that's the mentality with which we approach nature, that nature always needs our improvement. It's insufficient on its own. Um, uh, th there's a real impoverishment of um, what the creation is in that, in that view. I think that's an incredibly insulting view to God's creations. Uh, there is a self-sufficiency to the world. And an independent beauty that that you know doesn't need us uh, it's there and it is its own source of uh, m wonder and integrity and I think I think you know to the degree that some of these critics are right that Mormons uh, maybe have um, forgotten to be able to see beauty um, on its own terms and to appreciate what we have, what our circumstances are as blessings in and of them, already b blessings in and of themselves, then, then I think we need to learn that. I think, and that takes, that actually takes some um, unlearning because modern society and technology have, have ingrained in us this sense of, you know, I'm improving nature when I'm improving, uh, when I have air conditioning and so on and so forth. And I mean, I, I enjoy those blessings as much as anybody else. But if that's, if we're not able to appreciate um, what it means to be in a semi-arid desert, for example, and what the limitations that that might impose on us might be, or if we can't look at our valleys in Utah and say, okay, these valleys are shaped in such a way that they trap pollutants a little more readily than other places in the country. So that might mean that we have to live within a certain kind of restraint that maybe someplace else we wouldn't need. There's a geographical context yeah. to where we are. So that right. the n amount of emissions in Utah, for example, have, have a different environmental impact than, than in, in another right. geographical setting. So it seems to me that we've, we've really wanted to create a... It's like how the church has you know, our buildings all around the world, and we feel comfortable going into them because it's, this is familiar to us, this is home, and you can go anywhere in the world and have that. It's almost like environmentally we want that. We we want to be able to, when we go to Arizona, walk into an air-conditioned building and feel the same in that building as we would in, you know, uh, in some other place in the country. Yeah, well, and speaking of Arizona, when I lived there, I remember the director of the botanical garden in Phoenix he came up to Flagstaff to give a lecture, and he said, Every time he gets school kids in there, he asks the kids, um, how many of you live in a desert? And usually, no more than half of them raise their hand. They don't even know they're living in one. And uh, so this idea that I mentioned earlier of reconnaissance and of inhabitation, uh, you know, that's, that's the old way of life that human beings have had for thousands of years. You had to know where your water sources were, you had to understand the weather patterns, you had to understand the flora and the fauna and, and know the patterns of the land in order to be able to survive. And since we've now adopted a method of life that essentially makes it possible for us to be anywhere and nowhere at the same time, and it doesn't matter what our circumstances are, that's the danger we've created for ourselves because the fact of the matter is we all always are some place in particular that has 
certain characteristics and certain limitations and certain restraints. And if we always are thinking that we can engineer ourselves out of those restraints, um, we're, we're not le learning something fundamental about uh, what it means to be embodied and to be on this earth. I think one of the difficulties is it, it becomes um, it becomes easily politicized, right? Um, land, location, and resources. So we've talked about the idea of, of us thinking that the world needs our improvement, but I think there's also a sense of utilitarianism where we the world has been given, the earth has been given as a gift for use. And so there's this, there's the old Mormon pioneer saying of, you know, make it do, wear it out, whatever, you know, I don't yeah. remember. Make it, it do or do without. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. right. So so we sort of do that with the earth where, hey, we've, we have this thing to use. So yeah. if we've got oil here or if we've got resources here, um, we need to use those things. Um, to the best of our advantage, they're gifts that God's given us. So, and, and then you, you, when you're faced with, with contemporary environmentalism, um, your book's theme is that, that these political issues, these decisions that we make socially about how we use our environment uh, involve what you call recompenses. So the decisions that we make have consequences. You refer to them as recompenses. You're referring to Isaiah. Um, there's a, a verse here. It's actually the one where Isaiah talks about the desert blossom, blossoming. He says, uh, Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it, for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. And the Lord here promises a year of recompenses. And he talks about the rivers turning to burning pitch. And there's this really environmental description of, of a falling, of, a, a, you know, of destruction. And, and, and you're making an argument that uh, you compare this to ecological law, that when, when humans live out of balance with the environment that they're in, they can expect recompenses. On the other side, uh, of the coin when they live within those constraints when they try to fulfill those ecological laws there's a blessing there's a recompense of blessing mm -hmm. right um, and that's a theme that sort of recurs throughout the book so um, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about that idea of recompense yeah um, yeah I think uh, uh, I, I think essentially what I was getting at is that um, uh, we we can't imagine. Um, I mean, maybe I give an example. If if you pray for rain, but then you never try to conserve water, that that, that strikes me as as um, as an imbalance, right? Theologically, it just doesn't feel right to me. I mean, Brigham Young said, "Pray as if everything depends on the Lord, and then act as if everything depends on you." So, if you if you pray for something, and say what you're praying for, as early Mormon pioneers, is that the desert will blossom as a rose, that you'll be able to survive in this climate. I'm entirely sympathetic to that ambition that the Mormon pioneers had, and I'm very moved by what they did and how they survived. Uh, and of course, I'm indebted to it. Those are my ancestors, um, but. You know, as human civilization has moved forward, we now understand more than ever before about what our impact on the environment is, and a lot of that impact is quite negative at this point. And when I see us in a position now where we're refusing to make changes uh, in order to adapt uh, our lifestyle in in the context of this new understanding, then something seems wrong to me. So I don't have I don't have an argument with the idea that God gave us the blessings of this earth to be used. The scriptures are pretty clear on that, but they're also clear that He gave us this earth to please us, to please the eye, and to gladden the heart, to enliven the soul, for smell and for taste, for the senses. He wanted us to have aesthetic experiences in the natural world. He wanted us to use the natural world with judgment, and with care, and with modesty. And it seems to me that if we find out that a certain resource is hurting the environment, our use of a certain resource is hurting the environment, then it makes sense to look for other better solutions. I think God intended us to use our ingenuity. I mean, there was a time when we used horses and carriages and streets were filled with manure. And, you know, uh, people might have argued back then, I don't know, if they said, we don't want to go to the automobile because... Um, you know, this is this is the better way. I'm sure that was a difficult transition, but on the other hand, we all saw the advantage of 
getting rid of that manure. Now we know that, that the use of fossil fuels is creating problems for us. Um, to, it, it's not an argument against the idea that f something like fossil fuels were a gift to say, but now maybe we need to use more ingenuity and more creativity and move beyond that. We've got wind, we've got sun, we've got geothermal energy. Those are as God-given as the fossil fuels. So I don't see why, if that's our logic, why we don't look aggressively at every and all Other options. Other gifts from God that aren't. Yeah. yeah, and see if we can't find a way to live in, in, greater, in greater balance. And it, like I said, it, easy, it easily becomes politicized, right? So it can slip into, like any political topic, environmentalism can easily slip into binary stereotypes. So what are some stereotypes about environmentalists that, that you've heard that where people sort of stereotype an environmentalist's position unfairly? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'd say that uh, often the assumption is that they're not religious. And even if they're not, I think that's unfair to assume that that's necessarily a negative. Um, but there is the assumption that environmentalists are uh, people who are more secular. My experience in, in many years in the environmental community is quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, worldwide, there's more happening across re world religions right now uh, in deep concern for the environment, and from the Catholic Church to Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam uh, and, and many different forms of Christianity, Judaism, we're both leaders at very, very high levels, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama and the Pope and so on, to um, local um, grassroots religious organizations who feel, including evangelicals and Baptists, right, who feel, and Mormons now, right, who feel concern about the environment and want to uh, rally uh, people of faith to act on behalf of the earth in answer to the responsibility that we have as stewards, right? That this is fundamental to what it means to be, in the Christian context, a Christian, but in other religions, to be Jewish or to be uh, Muslim and so on. So that's one stereotype. I, I would say the other stereotype is that he, uh, environmentalists sort of don't like people or that they uh, don't like families or that they don't, um, uh, that they prefer nature over uh, humanity. humanity. Yeah, and I, I again find that to be um, erroneous and, and a stereotype. Uh, sure, I've seen extremism in environmentalism, and I argue with that extremism when I see it uh, pretty vehemently. But on the whole, I'd say a lot of environmentalists are motivated for their kids. They're motivated for their great-grandkids. They're, they're thinking about future generations. They're not they're not thinking just about the polar bear or about the spotted owl or the tree. They're thinking about the human community and the human future. And I think that's something that we can all uh, get behind. There are a lot of stereotypes about Mormons, too. I, yeah. We were just talking about some of them, and I've, I've argued with those stereotypes as well. Um, to put the shoe on the other foot, though, what are some stereotypes that you've heard from the environmental perspective about people who, who don't share that same sensibility or who, who aren't concerned? as much or who make sort of opposing arguments? Are there stereotypes yeah. that exist about the other side of that conversation? Yeah, I, I think, and this is, this is a tough problem, but I think a lot of people uh, who are very concerned about the environment and when they see people who aren't, the immediate assumption is that they have no love for nature, um, that they are motivated by greed or they're motivated by um, indifference, you know, uh, if you can be motivated by indifference. But they're yeah. just <laughs> acting out of indifference. Right. They're, they don't care about beauty or they don't care about animals or they don't care about uh, beautiful sunsets or anything. And I think it's actually a very, very rare person who doesn't respond to nature in a positive way and doesn't feel appreciative of natural gifts when they experience them. Um, and some people's anti-environmentalism uh, comes from, it's more anti-federalism or anti-government or it's anti-democrat or it's uh, uh, anti-secularism and they just use environmental issues as a, uh, as their, as their, you know, their football that they're fighting over uh, with the other team, and I and I th I think that's unfortunate. I mean, we we've got to stop wrestling with each other and start caring for the world that 
all of us share. I mean, it's it's not um, it's not a Mormon Earth, and it's not a non-Mormon Earth. It's not a Republican Earth or a Democrat Earth. It's not an American or a Chinese Earth. It's it's God's creation for every one of us. There's an excerpt that I want you to read, kind of on that topic, and it's it's you talk about the need to resist cynicism, and that can be difficult because. You know, it can be easy to feel like what I do doesn't really make a difference or just kind of throw my hands up in the air. So this is uh, an excerpt from the book on, on that issue. Having left the choked highways of California behind me, I was beginning to learn that cynicism and detachment are no better ingredients for building a sustainable culture than negative protectiveness and loyalty which is another way of saying I committed to strive to make a home here in this liminal space between water's bounty and the desert, between wilderness and civilization, because doing so would be a more effective resistance to this wretched progress than any amount of chafing. And I could only hope that I just might stand a chance of learning something that most urbanites have long since forgotten. The only real cure for provincialism is not dictated by our awareness of the size and diversity of the human family alone, but also by our awareness of the staggering size and diversity of the more than human community of nature. So yeah, I, I wrote that in, in, in uh, <laughs> it was actually sort of in uh, the context of a conversation I had with some uh, friends of ours from California who were feeling a little sorry for us because we had moved to Provo and they thought that <laughs> Provo was a sad backwater of provincialism and so on and that homogeneity was inherently a, a, a bad thing or a, a problem. And while I recognized where that was coming from, I was raised in, in Connecticut, schooled in California and had always been a tiny minority as a Mormon and suddenly I was in this super majority in Provo and it was a little weird and a difficult adjustment to, to undergo. But I, I thought that, on the other hand, uh, something about these smaller, more intimate communities um, meant that I had to know people a lot better than I did in some urban context where I'd lived. And not only that, the natural world here in Utah in particular is, the natural world, of course, is ubiquitous, right? We're always on the earth. We're always in nature. Yeah. But there's something about living here along the Wasatch Front where you can you can step outside of your front door and within very short time uh, be in a place that could kill you uh, <laughs> because of natural events or be in a place where you can really feel alone and vulnerable in a really powerful and, and renewable, renewing way. And I think that's what people hunger for when they're constantly hiking up canyons and going for bike rides and uh, walking or running on trails is that they're, they're wanting that. And, and the fact that it's so close and proximate to where we live in Utah is uh, uh, a great, uh, can, has the potential to build a really powerful kind of community I mean, again, all I wanted to say was appreciating cultural diversity is a value. I share that. Appreciating biological diversity is another value. And those are not mutually exclusive. And those ought to be mutual goals uh, in, in, in a good community. A good community, a good society knows where it lives ecologically, and it knows its history in terms of its multicultural roots, right? It's not a community that only sees itself as one tribe. And that was what maybe I felt needed tweaking in my experience here was that we could do a better job in the Mormon culture of the Wasatch Front in Utah of understanding other histories, other people who came here um, before and after and during the, the mm -hmm. Mormon uh, arrival here, and uh, people who were here, of course, already, the Native Americans, and we could do a better job of understanding where we are ecologically. Another th uh, Mormon theme that you bring up repeatedly is this idea of embodiment and the importance of embodiment and how it feels to be to be a body. That God created a place for 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 bodies. Uh, there's a beautiful line uh, where you talk about um, to uh, let's see uh, where you say that the body is the cup in which to drink the world. So you're getting re really poetic here, but it's a, be it's a beautiful sentiment. The body is the cup in which to drink the world. And so this theme of embodiment just 
keeps cropping up. Um, you find yourself not only in a physical body, but also embodied in geographical settings. Yeah. Um, and well, the, the, the thing is, uh, one of the arguments uh, against the Judeo-Christian tradition in, in recent decades, especially given our environmental concerns, has been that it's not a good thing for us to value the spirit over the body to the degree that we um, disparage or denigrate or degrade the body, right? Um, Mormonism shares that attitude, right? I mean, when we when we think of, and maybe this is an unfair stereotype, I think it is, of, uh, say, older Christian notions of the fall and of the body, but nevertheless, if we if we assume for a moment that there's a Christian position that says, the body is inherently sinful, it's inherently degraded, um, it is just a passing stage. It was especially in, in early Gnosticism, right, where they were saying the material creation was made by, by, a, by an evil god. Uh, salvation comes from escaping it. So at yeah. least we can say it was definitely exactly. a Gnosticism. So you just suffer through this yeah. and get through it and escape, you get, it. escape it and get on to something better. And while you're here, don't be deceived by illusions. Don't get overly attached to earthly things. And um, that attitude has contributed to an anti-environmental ethos, right? When you say, well, wh why bother caring for something if it's going to die anyway, right? We, on the other hand, in a theology of embodiment, have to look at that differently. I mean, we don't, uh, and, and by the way, the, the, what our attitudes toward the body are similar to our attitudes about the earth, right? I mean, if heaven is the preferred location and earth is the dangerous place where we fall into sin so easily and we've got to get out of here as quickly as possible that's that's a that's a mentality that doesn't lend itself really well to you know sitting around and appreciating beauty let alone taking care of it right there's a sense of the sooner i get out of here the better mm -hmm. and uh, oddly enough mormons have adopted some of those attitudes even though our theology says this is actually where we're aiming for we're trying to get here the earth will be the, the, earth will be the kingdom. celestial kingdom, right? God is a, is a God of flesh and bone. And my body is necessary. Uh, the, the attachment or the marriage between the spirit and the body is necessary for my progress. It is, I must learn how to bring those two together in some sort of harmonious relationship. And in fact, it's not just a necessary evil partnership. It's actually a glorification, right? Right. So by that I understand to mean if God says I gave you the earth so that you have food and raiment but I also gave it to you so that you have pleasure that something happens to you when you look at my beautiful trees that I've created and you look at my beautiful animals and you contemplate a river bend and you feel spiritual in the very moment that you're experiencing something very sensual what does that mean? Right? That means your body is actually becoming a vehicle of spiritual enhancement and renewal. It's not an obstacle that you're bypassing. It's actually the portal through which spiritual experiences of the deepest kind become possible. Yeah, there's a, a great section of the book that I'll, that I'll have you read as well. That, that the, way, the way I would sum it up is you're saying that the physical world isn't a place where we discover our alienation from the divine, but where we discover that the divine has a place within the stuff of, of material and mortal existence, like it's part of it. Um, it's not something that, that we're estranged from God with, it's something that we can reconnect with God through. And yeah. um, this is a section that you kick off um, talk, talking uh, with your son Sam. Okay. It seems to me that when my son Sam announced one day upon entering my bedroom, I want to be an animal. He was expressing the spirit's unique impulse to explore the dimensions of physical experience. Which kind, I asked. A lizard, a fish, and a bird. When pressed for his reasons, he was equally deliberate and forthcoming. To be fast, to swim, and to fly. Precisely because the life of the body is so thoroughly enjoyable, it surprises me just how often I crave the chances to be startled by those small discoveries that I am something more than flesh and bone. Emily Dickinson was right. Doubting keeps belief nimble, and doubting the ultimate reality of my biology seems only to intensify the simple pleasures of the flesh, which is why I am drawn to this place at the side of a river in the mountains. 
I must at least admit this to myself. Earth is an odd place to find myself, and the oddness of it is precisely what makes it so intoxicating. This is a one-time affair, never to be repeated again, and I want all of it. Children pulsating and growing in my arms, this aspen half-dressed in yellow, with that dead black branch extending itself into the air for no one, this compost with its nuggets of pine tar under these feet, here, now. Even without Moses striking the rock, God's hot pebbles on human lips, or stones illuminated by his finger's touch, who can miss the earth's glow? That's George Handley, an excerpt from his book, Home Waters. Going back to something you mentioned a minute ago, you talk about eschatology, end times, culmination. Um, are there elements of Mormon theology that have hindered an environmental awareness? If there are, I think this might be one of them, the idea that uh, Jesus will return to the earth, it will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. So in the meantime, we don't have too much to worry about. God's going to take care of it. These people that talk about climate change and these people that talk about running out of resources and things, don't worry about it. God has it under control. Yeah, boy, that's a real tough problem for a lot of Christians, not just Mormons. Uh, I mean, Mormons are, of course, um, maybe even more uh, conscious of the idea of being in the latter days given the title of our church. Um, but um, when you, what I try to do in the book is try to think more deeply about eschatology and about the idea of the end. Um, death, Wallace Stevens, uh, the poet, said, is the mother of all beauty. And what he meant by that was that because we're aware that something is ending or will end or that will never remain the same, we, we actually... Um, cling to it even more. So when you think about a child, you look at a child, uh, certainly the idea that the child is mortal causes us to love a child intensely. I mean, every parent worries, right, that the child will not uh, live to full adulthood and so on. But it's not just the death, the uh, mortal death that we're afraid of. There's also change that's a kind of death. I mean, if you're like me, you know, I look at my little kids when they were when they were young and I would get weepy just over the fact that they weren't going to stay that My way. My wife and we just talked about this last night. We got we have a nine month old, and and we started grieving just this week about yeah. you know we we love this little nine month old, but she's going to go away in a yeah. sense. Yeah, and when you look back at pictures, it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. So, so there is that you know, and I th- but I think that's beautiful. I mean, I think that's what death. Why contemplation of death and being reminded of our mortality is very valuable. So I thought, well, look, why, why is the idea, I mean, when you think about Christ coming, um, Christ coming is a reminder of our death. And I actually had a very, I recount this briefly in the book, but I had a very personal experience after I went through the temple for the first time when I was getting ready to go on my mission where I dreamed that the second coming was coming and I was floating up into the sky, right? I'd been taken up and... I remember in the dream, I mean, I was excited, you know, I was like, oh, this is interesting. But I was sad because I remember, I realized my life was over, that the end had come. And I wasn't going to be able to enjoy another, uh, you know, soccer game or a nice hike on a mountain or listening to great uh, music at the symphony hall. It was all gone. It was all taken from me. And, And I thought, Maybe we're just not thinking well enough about the end times because if we thought about them profoundly, it would cause us to feel more appreciation, to want to slow down, soak in every bit of experience we can, and be profoundly grateful and full of love for the gift of existence, right? That's what that ought to inspire in us. But unfortunately, We've adopted a very nihilistic um, attitude of, well, the earth is going to die anyway. Why should I bother taking care of it? I mean, I've pointed out a hundred times over to people whenever that comes up, I'll say, would you ever say that about your own body? Yeah. Would you say that because you're going to die and resurrect, you might as well pollute your body all you can right now? Because, hey, the fact is you got a chance and you're going to get a brand new one, spank and clean. It's going to be the best thing ever. I mean, why aren't we out partying all the time? Yeah. Eat all you want, do right. all you want. Yeah. So it's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will resurrect. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's essentially what we're saying to ourselves when we about say... About the earth. About right? the earth. Yeah. Why bother taking care of it if it's going to die anyway? I, I find that to be, it, if we thought about it, th- thought it through, it's a profound disrespect for Christ's creation 
and for his atonement. He is the center of what this earth is all about. He's the creator and the atoner. And to and 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 to say that you know I'm going to mistreat something because I've got this guaranteed uh, contract is to me a, a profound expression of ingratitude for that for that gift. So it, it yeah it doesn't make a difference what we do in some sense, but it makes a difference. It makes all the difference what we do in in a spiritual sense, right? Because it says something about what kind of integrity we have and what kind of profound appreciation we have for what Christ did. It's interesting that that came up for you in the context of the temple. And, and you, you talk about the temple a few times throughout the book, and I, I kind of feel like um, the temple ceremony itself is, is one of the most frequent experiences that Mormons have reminding them of um, the importance and majesty of, of God's creation, right? This, this may be the most... Um, ecological moment that the average temple attending Mormons experience, right? Yeah. Um, so here's an excerpt from the book as well uh, that sort of talks about the temple experience in, in, these, in this context. Well, first I, I start this passage out with a um, quotation from the book of Moses. These are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that I, the Lord God, made the heaven and the earth and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. Joseph Smith's revelation about the creation is a recreation in two senses. The story needed to be told again, and the world needed to be created twice. And so Chiasmus imagined before it was spoken, before it was spoken, spoken before it became flesh. Sensation of the flesh inspires words, and words the life of the spirit. Deeper still in the heart of the temple, the creation of the world is commemorated as a reminder of the care with which the Lord created diversity and of how our own hands and minds played a role in honoring the world's beauty, and, before it is gone, how our hands might still have more work to do. I might have added how our hands and minds still have more work to do, because some of this, I think, is work of the mind and imagination. Yeah, and you mentioned vision as well, learning to see landscapes in different ways, and I, I think that that leads to different actions as well. I mean, just, I, I hadn't read much about the environmental history of um, of, of Utah before I read this book and it, and it did I find myself uh, my eyes open a bit a bit more and that's that's what I would hope readers would take away from it is a, a greater awareness of of the environment I think as Mormons we could definitely stand to hear about that uh, more frequently so um, one of my last questions we have a few more questions one of them pertains to leadership so the narrative the theology that you lay out when you talk about the creation and an embodiment and, and our responsibility and stewardship towards the earth. This is, this is all found in Mormon scripture, but it's not something that members of the church are getting in church manuals often. It's not something that they're hearing in general conference very often. So how do you, how do you can you speak to that uh, issue as far as um, the role of church leadership and you know, not counseling what the leaders should do, but maybe talking about, um, about why you think things are that way, or, or, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe you are more attuned to statements from leadership or to things in our manuals that call attention to these things that I'm overlooking. Well, that's a, that's a really important question. I think um, sometimes I'm a little disheartened when people uh, will say, well, if, if, if caring for the environment were such a big deal, then why haven't we heard about it from, from church leaders? Uh, maybe they'll specifically uh, mention climate change or biodiversity loss or whatever. Um, and so there is a tendency, and I'll sort of say, well, look, you know, the church doesn't speak about every issue that comes up. I haven't heard them say a whole lot about specific uh, problems of genocide in Africa and specific locations or uh, human trafficking. I, I, I'm not, you know, there are lots of issues in the world today that are very serious problems. And that, but that doesn't mean that they're not serious problems. Um, you know, we're we're commanded to be engaged, uh, anxiously engaged in a good cause. And I I see this uh, caring for the environment as a very good cause. It stems directly from our 
uh, doctrine. So I don't see any inconsistency there, and I, you know, I don't feel uncomfortable because um, I might be, you know, doing something I'm not supposed to do as a Mormon. I do think, uh, you know, I, w I would very much hope someday that we would have more in our curriculum than we currently have. Uh, last spring, um, there was a symposium at the University of Utah, the law school Stegner Symposium, on religion, faith, and the environment. And the LDS Church was approached and asked to have a representative come and speak about Mormon views of stewardship. They had a representative from Is Islam and uh, from Buddhism and other church leaders, and they wanted a Mormon. They sent Elder Marcus Nash, and he was sent by the First Presidency to represent the church in an official way, and he gave a masterful talk about stewardship. It was the first time that I'm aware of in the history of the church where a talk has been exclusively devoted to that subject in that comprehensive a way as he gave it. Having said that, he quoted prophets. Not only did he quote prophets, he quoted the scriptures. And so it, it, you can find statements by almost every leader of the church about stewardship specifically environmental stewardship if you look but it does require a little more digging than than I sometimes uh, uh, wish were the case and it and it was true in the 19th century and early 20th century that church leaders spoke more frequently about it than they do now um, in part because the people were engaged in settling this valley and environmental issues were on everybody's mind and so overgrazing and water issues and so on had to be kind of sort the ethics of all that had to be sorted out um, but now it's kind of a global issue and it's a cross-cultural issue and it's also become highly politicized so I can mm -hmm. understand why there's some reticence there to not uh, wade into political waters and create political implications when they're not intended what do you um, suggest so what are some practical um, things that Mormons could do then I think Mormons can focus on our principles and I think we should I think we should be very proud of them and I think we should try to live up to them and there are lots of things we can do. I mean, we can, we can be much more conscientious in teaching uh, about stewardship and helping people understand their environment. Um, some of that's embodied in what we do as with Boy Scouts and with young women. Um, uh, we, we can have ward activities that are service related that are serving the creation in some way, cleaning and repairing and, and promoting better stewardship as civic as members of society uh, in civic in the civic sphere uh, I think Mormons ought to be a strong voice of advocacy for good and and sound environmental principles of, of stewardship and I don't think we've come close to living up to that yet you participate in some venues isn't there a group that you're involved with that does some of that I'm, I'm involved in two groups one is called LDS Earth Stewardship uh, I'm on the board of that organization we have a website we have uh, a blog we have um, activities and uh, a conversation going and we're trying to promote better citizenship among LDS members uh, with regard to the environment not just in terms of practical matters but but it starts with practical matters how do I how do I manage the economy of a home where's my energy coming from am I using my energy efficiently can I drive less can I use more public transportation how can I lessen my impact on the earth how can we do that when we have ward activities when we have uh, uh, those kinds of things I think are, are relevant and then there's the civic and political question what how do what are the major issues confronting us what what's what's affecting our water use what's affecting air quality what's affecting climate change what's affecting biodiversity loss what can I do to preserve places for future generations in a way that's still uh, allows us to you know have a, a healthy economy I mean those are those are tough and difficult issues but I think they're on Mormons minds and I think Mormons need to see models one of the things we've tried to do with LDS Earth Stewardship is promote examples just uh, we've got one blogger who's just writing a brief biography about these marvelous Mormon stewards who are out doing great things for the environment and asking them what motivates them and what are they doing um, so there's lots of Mormons engaged in environmentalism that's one of the big uh, secrets uh, they just aren't always identified as Mormon they don't always get pointed out as Mormon even by the press the press will generally point out when an anti-environmental position is pro uh, 
uh, supported by a Mormon, but they won't always do the same for, for a Mormon position. I'm also part of an interfaith group called Utah Interfaith Power and Light, which is uh, an interfaith organization that's national. This is the Utah chapter of it, uh, devoted to helping communities of faith to fight climate change. And uh, we work with different uh, faith communities to help them do energy audits and, um, you know, get solar panels for their buildings and so on and so forth. And in the LD when it comes around to LDS issues and LDS people, we, we've uh, looked at different ways to try to promote good stewardship. We've ha uh, actually sponsored a couple of tours of the Farmington Chapel in, in Utah that was LEED certified and had uh, solar panels and the whole whole nine yards in terms of energy efficiency and tried to give that a lot of attention because we thought that was a wonderful and promising development in the church. The church is actually doing a remarkable amount of things uh, on the ground in terms of how they build and um, even their ranches are very uh, eco-friendly in terms of their practices. They don't always advertise these things. Um, but I think that's going to change. I mean, I think it has to. I think we need to, we need to take uh, more leadership. It's, it seems a lot of Mormons, at least along the Wasatch Front, would hear something about climate change and be sort of dismissive about it. So have you ran into any barriers as far as talking to Mormons about climate change that that say, oh, that's that are skeptical about that or push back on oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that skepticism, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to the, dis the conversation. I don't, I don't think it's a conversation we should shy away from. Um, I will say this, I mean, there's a lot to say on that subject. Um, there are interesting roots of that skepticism um, that that are not always looking directly at the evidence, but looking, uh, I mean, for example, uh, you know, studies have shown that um, people who believe in, in a reduced role of government, which is, of course, descriptive of, of most Republicans, um, find climate change harder to believe in and that and that's understandable if you if you really are wary of the size of government and the bureaucracy of government climate change is a massive global problem that requires large government solutions so mm -hmm. it's it's not it's a, a it's not a problem that that's going to you're going to want to jump at and of course if you already believe in large government solutions like a lot of liberals do then then you know you say hey that's an easy one we can fix we can fix it with big large government solutions uh, so there are some predispositional reasons why some people are more prone to believe in climate change than others. Um, but one thing I would say, I mean, there's a lot more to say about that, but I would say, first of all, we have to be, we have to read, uh, in order to understand where we are, reconnaissance, inhabitation, I need to understand ecology, and I, I need to understand science on some rudimentary level, and it's not that hard. You can look to reliable sources from our National Academy of Sciences and other uh, institutes of science in this country and get, get the straight science without the policy implications, just the science. We can deliberate about policy, and, but we should be clear on principle. What are our principles, right? We ought to be clear about um, what our responsibilities are to the creation and what it means to be accountable to God as stewards and whether we have uh, redis uh, you know, more conservative or more liberal positions on the environment, we ought to be able to agree that the environment matters and that we are mutually committed to taking care of it, even if we can't agree right off the bat on what the right policies are. I think if we stopped fighting the perpetual battles we always seem to fight politically, we'd actually get farther if we focused on our, our shared principles across political divides. Do you see encouraging signs in, in the projects that you've been participating in that, that suggest that, that that's a direction that we seem to be headed? Well, I think more, more Mormons are uh, thinking about environmental stewardship than ever before. I mean, I've lived in Utah now for 15 years, and it's gotten better every year in terms of awareness and a sense of shared responsibility and the motivation of people to do something about it. Young people in particular are very inspiring to me in that regard. Um, I think we're going to find that the need for solutions is so great that we will, we will come to compromises a little more easily. Uh, we're going to need to. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that belief in climate change as a problem was very high in 2008 before the downturn. It was in the top five issues that concerned Americans right. on the, in the vast majority. 
and then it dropped way down when the economy crashed but it's gone back up and actually a recent survey said that most republicans care about climate change as a problem that is caused by human beings the majority of republicans care about it um, what's i think problematic is that the um, the elected uh, um, officials at both at state and national uh, levels are not um, as responsive to the attitudes of the general majority because the general majority is disconnected. We're not reading the newspaper, we're not paying attention to how people are voting, we're not engaged in the conversation civically, and I think I think everyone ought to read their paper every day. I think they ought to read a, a local paper as well as a national paper every single day. I think that ought to be as soon as we're done reading our scriptures, <laughs> that's got to be, we've got to be informed about what's going on. That's what it means to be in a democracy. Are there any other sources you would recommend in terms of people that, that want to read up on things like climate change or um, environmental stewardship? Are there any other sources you would recommend that people check out? Uh, well, I think a great book on climate change is a book called The Weather Makers by Tim, uh, Tim Flannery. Uh, it's a very good uh, description of the science. It's very measured and um, uh, clear and easy to, uh, you know, very accessible. Um, I would say the National Academy of, the Sci of Sciences in, in the United States, which is widely recognized as the gold standard for scientific objectivity, has tremendous resources on their website. They actually have a 30-minute video about on a YouTube video about climate change that is about the most effective way uh, to disseminate that information quickly and in an accessible way. Um, and there, there are lots of great writers. Uh, Wendell Berry is a fantastic uh, novelist, essayist, a poet who writes about the environment. Wallace Stegner uh, wrote about the West and the environment in some of the most important and foundational ways. Um, and there's just, there's just uh, nature writing in America is one of the greatest literary treasures of this country. And uh, we ought to know our nature writers, not just Henry David Thoreau, but John Muir, John Burroughs, uh, Terry Tempest Williams, um, Edward Abbey. I mean, there's, there's a long list of, of great nature writers in this country and in the West in particular, if for those who live in the West, that, that we ought to be uh, drawing some inspiration from. And just uh, kind of as a parting thought as well, I think your your experiences in um, going out into the natural environment and, and reflecting on it and writing about it, um, those are those are things that anybody can do, um, that that anybody can spend time doing. And it seems to me, based on your book, that it was uh, that it was really fruitful for you. Uh, and so there's one last excerpt that I want you to read that talks about. Um, what what uh, recreation did for you there's you you acknowledge there's sometimes a little bit of indulgence in it because there are daily responsibilities that people have to fulfill you have responsibilities to your wife and you talk about that and you, the responsibilities to your children and you talk about that and trying to balance connecting with nature with with connecting with family and and fulfilling yeah. all your responsibilities so um there's a little section here that sort of reflects on that yeah, maybe just before I read it, just sure. comment quickly that um, I think uh, I remember a conversation I had with a Mormon once about this, and he said, I'd love to care about the environment, but i got too many other things to worry yeah. about, and church service demands too much of my time. And, and I'm very uh, sympathetic to that issue. I think it's um, a mistake to assume this is an added thing. I think it gets integrated into how we live in a way that makes our ward activities, our time with our children, and our time in our community more valuable rather than adding on burdens. That's that's how I would respond to that. And, and you know, having just concluded a week backpacking trip in the Wind Rivers with my son and other youth in my ward, um, you know, there's nothing, I think, more, more pleasurable than those kinds of experiences with family. So this is the passage. But maybe I can find in my recreation some way of rec reconnecting to my history and community. I must confess that even though Mormonism was founded because of a boy's encounter with God in the woods, Mormon life makes steep demands on my time and does not provide many chances for solitary meditation away from the trappings and idols of modern convenience. So my idols are stolen... 
uh, our idols spelled I-D-Y-L-L-S, are stolen moments of restoration, attempts to begin to understand this particular watershed that made settlement possible along the Wasatch Front and sustains life there to this day. If I can but translate the, me the significance of these moments into a language of common understanding, I will not have wasted my time. Uh, I would just say in conclusion that I think um, my recreational experiences were intended for deeper understanding that I could share. And I wrote that book first and foremost for my children. And, and you know, to my dying day, I feel like that will be one of the better testaments to what life was like for me and what kind of a heritage I hope to pass on that, to them than almost anything else. Um, so it was always motivated by my heart being turned to them um, and and to my community. I mean, I and I, I mean, I sort of extend that to the the Mormon family, as it were, and the non-Mormon family and the non-human family. <laughs> um, but I do think, uh, if 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 used in the right way, recreation enhances our life spiritually. But it needs to be connected to some sort of spiritual and ethical commitment. If recreation is just entertainment and it's just mechanized and it's just escapism it's not it's it's actually counterproductive but if recreation reintegrates re renews and uh, uh, recommits us to a life of sacrifice and service and giving then i think it's it's function is very obvious thanks that's uh that's george handley he's the author of home waters and a professor at brigham young university thanks All for right. the interview you bet thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.